Welcome, everybody. Um, I am uh, so happy to see you guys here and welcome you on behalf of the National Press Club and the National Press Club Journalism Institute. I'm Julie Moose. I am the executive director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute, which is working to close the gap between journalism and civic engagement. And this program uh, really grows out of that mission. We're going to talk tonight about building trust. Trust is central both to journalism and to democracy. And we want to understand how trust grows, particularly between two groups of people, people with high stakes information of public interest and the journalists who shape how that information turns into stories of public consequence. So I'm here with this panel I'm so proud to be sitting with tonight. And uh, I'm going to introduce them. So first, we have Amy Britton who is an investigative reporter at the Washington Post and part of a team that won the Pulitzer Prize. Next, oh, feel free. <laughs> uh, and modest, too. Um, next, we have Lauren Clark, who is a stylist at Immortal Beloved, which she just learned was featured in Washingtonian's Best of DC. We have Kristen Eliason, who is co-director of legal programs with Network for Victim Recovery of DC. <laughs> and we have Maura Judkis, who is a James Beard award-winning reporter for the Washington Post as well. <laughs> so thank you guys for being here tonight, for spending time with us. And um, as I said, we're going to talk about building trust, and we're going to talk about it um, in the context of the work that you did together towards the story that became The Man Who Attacked Me Works in Your Kitchen. Before we can talk about that and how you built trust in telling it, we need to start a little bit earlier in April 2013. And I'm going to ask Amy to start there. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate it. So uh, Lauren, at the time, lived in an apartment in Upper Northwest West Washington. And she, like many people in DC, loved to go for jogs after work. So one evening in April of 2013, she got home after work. After a long day of talking with clients, she changed clothes. And she headed out her door for what she thought would be um, a typical kind of peaceful evening running through the city. She remembers the beginning of this night very well because I think like many of us, sometimes she's kind of stunned by the beauty of the city. And it was one of those days where the cherry blossoms were in peak bloom. It was unseasonably warm. And she went all the way down to the waterfront in Georgetown. And she kind of stopped to take in the scenery there, took some pictures, and then made her way back home. And on the way back, she was cooling down. She had slowed her pace to a walk. And suddenly she saw a man who made her feel um, unsettled. And when I think about that moment that Lauren experienced, um, I'm sure that uh, many women in the room have probably felt that feeling being outside running or even just walking around that city. The moment where in the pit of your stomach you feel like something is not right and you kind of have a battle with yourself about what to do about it. Do you cross the street? Do you keep walking? Do you just try to ignore the person? And Lauren um, kind of had this battle in her head, and she decided not to cross the street and, and kept walking on her path. And before she knew it, uh, this man had grabbed her. Um, his hand was between her crotch. At the same time, he slammed her to the pavement. Um, he punched her in the face. She flipped over and was able to fight back. She clawed his face and was able to claw off his glasses. Suddenly, he grabbed her phone and ran. And Lauren, stunned, seething in anger, ran after him <laughs> um, and, and, and gave chase. Um, and she was able to flag down the police officers who happened to be nearby. And in many ways, what happened that night followed the course of what, um, what an ideal situation would look like as far as immediately reporting it to authorities telling someone she did what everyone should do in those circumstances of immediately telling law enforcement about this, you know, giving it an interview. Um, the police are driving her around and she sees um, the man who attacked her is just walking nearby. So uh, 
she soon finds out that another woman has been attacked just um, a short distance away in similar circumstances. And uh, this man is arrested and he has um, fresh scratch marks on his face. Uh, he's taken to the police station and a couple of hours later he confesses to both of these assaults that were very similar in nature. Um, so that was the evening of, of April 10th, uh, 2013. Um, what happened after that is that her case uh, in, in many ways took a quick path through D.C. Superior Court. He was you know, arrested, charged with misdemeanors, which was kind of the first surprising point of the story. He was charged with misdemeanor, uh, sexual abuse, and simple assault and theft um, for, for taking her cell phone, even though the police officers that night had assured Lauren that he would be charged with felony crimes for assaulting her. And um, pretty soon after the initial charges within D.C. Superior Court, he agreed to a plea deal, and the case headed towards sentencing. Lauren uh, gave a victim impact statement at sentencing, and this matter was, uh, in theory, settled in, in September 2013 when the defendant in this case, Jairo Cruz, was, um, well, I should say I skipped over a big, big point. <laughs> there, was, there was a big uh, surprise that happened during the sentencing phase during which um, Mr. Cruz had admitted to assaulting four other women in a similar way. Um, so in total, there were six women who he admitted in court to assaulting. He was charged with assaulting two of them. And he was sentenced to serve 10 days in jail, tailored to um, two-day stints, kind of like weekend stints to work around his schedule. And this is kind of another big reveal of the story is that he was a fairly prominent chef in D.C. who was working um, at a very popular restaurant in the city at the time. Uh, so that is what happened in 2013. Um, I did not know any of that at the time. This case did not make the news in 2013. Um, there was no public coverage of it. I did not find out about any of this until much, much later. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in fact, not only did these four not know each other in 2013, this is, I think, the first time all four of them have been together in person. Yeah. So again, happy to have you guys here to join us for this. So, um, so Lauren was very um, aware of what was happening and, and present in sentencing and, um, and after, and, and you, you were kind of keeping watch and discovered that he was working in a kitchen right around the corner from where you live. So talk about what happened next. Um, so the assault happened like just a couple blocks away from my apartment in Glover Park. Um, I lived there for almost a year, um, and it was it was not I, it was hard to mm -hmm. like to live there. Uh, and I lived alone in a basement apartment, so I felt very vulnerable. Um, and I moved um, to Dupont Circle, and um, right after I moved, I found out um, that he was working in a restaurant two blocks away from my apartment, um, and. You know, I had kind of moved to escape <laughs> this mm -hmm. situation a little bit um, and the fear that I felt. And so that was very much um, reestablished. Um, he could, you know, walk by at any time. Um, and I remember getting on my phone and just Googling, like, protection orders because I thought that there had been um, one established at the sentencing. Um, and I couldn't even like navigate the internet to figure that out. Um, and when I was uh, going through that Google search, I found um, MVRDC's website. Um, and I called them immediately. And I spoke with a lovely woman on the phone. And she said that someone would get back to me. Um, and very quickly, luckily, <laughs> uh, I think, Kristen, did you call me or did you email me? We got in touch with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think I think we may have spoken on the phone. I think we did speak on the yeah. phone. Yeah. Um, and um, I kind of laid out what had happened um, and my concerns. Uh, and really, I was I thought that I was protected. I thought that this person was encroaching on you know mm -hmm. my space um, and that I would have had you know some right to you know, 
keep him away. Um, it turns out that there wasn't really um, a um, protective order, so Kristen um, said that I could get, take him to civil court. Um, and so we did, um, and I got a protective order, which um, lasts for a year. Um, yeah. And that's kind of how, um, that was when I first met Kristen, and um, I did not know that uh, I would need her services beyond that point. <laughs> I thought that was kind of like, okay, now we're done with this. You know, a year later, like reengaging felt like a big deal. Um, and, you know, I had no idea what was um, to come. Uh, but I did feel a little bit safer, and I felt very empowered that I, you know, faced him in court, you know, a second time, third time. Um, and it felt more proactive, you know, like this is, I'm, I'm in civil court, like I'm doing this, this mm -hmm. isn't just like a criminal case, this is, this is my move. Um, and so I think that was very empowering and it was incredible to have Kristen's support um, and like knowledge navigating the situation because it was obviously um, a pretty like anxiety uh, ridden situation for me. Um, yeah, so. That's how I met Kristen. And so, um, so at that point, again, it sounds like you thought, okay, good, this is it, maybe now we're done. And then um, we fast forward a couple more years, and um, again, you were really vigilant about what was going on with the case and discovered that, in fact, there had been some lapses, that, that the sentencing was not being enacted in quite the way that was anticipated. So um, maybe you and Kristen can talk a little bit about what happened there and, um, and then the flyers. Well, actually, I, I found out about the lapses in the case because um, I was driving to Georgetown going shopping with my little sister, and we drove by the restaurant mm -hmm. that he was working at, and um, it was closed. It was gone. Not there anymore. And I was like, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> now I don't know where he works and I don't know it like felt safer to know that he was there and I had moved I was on 14th Street um, living and working on 14th Street um, and uh, I got on Instagram and I found him on Instagram and he had posted something in December saying that he worked at Le Diplomat and that is right down the street from where I work and where I live and so this is like round two <laughs> like really this person is in my life again um, I'd actually eaten at the restaurant um, after he had been employed there uh, in December. And um, I called Kristen. <laughs> yeah, um, I, was, I was really concerned. Um, I think the, there, I mean, I, I'm probably not a stranger in this room to say that the criminal justice system or the criminal injustice system is really not set up mm -hmm. to really do anything it just doesn't really help anybody, I think, ultimately, is the, oops, sorry, is the, the issue. So my biggest concerns were um, the civil protection order had lapsed because he had, um, as far as we know, um, hadn't, um, well, there hadn't been anything that, that Lauren had felt needed to be brought back to court for. Mm -hmm. So um, there was no CPO in place, and like Lauren talked about, the stay away in the criminal case was not a great stay away order. It was pretty garbage. It just basically said stay away from her and then the address where she was assaulted, which wasn't where she lived. Um, and they're not enforceable in the same way that the civil orders are enforceable. And pretty much all the power to enforce any kind of violation in the criminal case is done through the prosecutor's office. Um, so I was definitely very concerned about the fact that he seemed to disregard um, the, the nature of the stay order in the criminal case and really disregard... Um, from, from my perspective, the whole process that Lauren had been through, coming to court and talking about what had happened and really what the judge had said to him, um, and what a punishment that um, to a lot of people is probably pretty surprising, and, but to me it wasn't because it's kind of what we see every day. Um, but the fact that he kind of got off, in my opinion, um, pretty lightly and then was kind of just didn't really seem to respect um, the, kind of the nature of the case. Um, it was also concerning because I believe when Lauren went on Instagram, one of the photos was of him drinking. And part of his conditions of his probation following his sentence was that he was to abstain from any sort of substance use, alcohol or drugs, um, uh, non-medicinal 
prescribed by a doctor type of drug. So that and was... The, and the reason for that is because part of his defense had been that he was drinking the night that he assaulted Lauren and exactly. the other woman and that the alcohol had somehow led him to do this. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so from my perspective, not just from being an attorney, but from being an advocate for survivors of crime, that to me is like, you're not respecting anything that the court has told you. So um, from my perspective, what is keeping you really from hurting someone else or hurting um, Lauren again? Uh, so those were two things that we were definitely really concerned about um, that we wanted to address. Um, and then I, did you look on the court's website or did I look on the court's I website? I did. I think you had looked yeah. on the court's website and Lauren had brought to my attention that he had had a probation review hearing in April of 2017. I hope this time has passed by so quickly. In April 2017, um, and so I started doing some digging to figure out kind of what had happened at that hearing. The way it was described in the court docket was extremely alarming because it seemed like his probation had just been um, um, uh, ended um, before the time, the five years that he had been um, sentenced to probation had been up. So I was concerned about that. I was concerned that he was so close to Lauren. Um, it wasn't a secret where Lauren worked. I believe he talked about it in your victim impact statement, but if not, we had put it as part of the stay away conditions in the civil protection order. So it wasn't like, you know where mortal beloved is. And we also actually, as part of the CPO, had had him agree the civil protection order to staying away from um, a certain block radius around Lauren's home and workplace. So. Um, even Which he that, violated like a couple months after yeah. he parked right in front of my front door while I was outside. Yeah, so <laughs> so there was like just this clear disregard for even though the CPO wasn't in place anymore, there was this disregard for a woman has asked you to stay away from her and you just continue to disregard the boundaries that she has set for you, that the court has ordered you, that you have agreed to because part of probation and part of the CPO was that he agreed to those things being issued against him. Um, so uh, my kind of first thoughts were to review the record, to kind of figure out what we could figure out about what had happened at the hearing, um, talk to my amazing boss, Bridget, who's here, <laughs> um, and really kind of figure out what are our next steps that we need to take um, and talk with Lauren really about what her goals were because I wasn't going to take any steps really without making sure they were what Lauren wanted to do. Um, and so uh, the next step, I guess, was that I filed, an, uh, filed a motion with the court um, basically to have his... Um, sentencing reviewed and to have him basically put back on probation, um, which is um, a pretty rare thing that happens, and, and, and really to have the court um, review kind of what had happened because this hearing happened. Lauren's rights as a crime victim under the Crime Victims Rights Act, which is a federal law that applies both nationally and to local cases here prosecuted in D.C., um, and under the D.C. Crime Victims Bill of Rights, Lauren was entitled to a whole host of rights, such as being notified that the hearing was happening. Um, the right to be heard at the hearing. Um, all of those things were basically disregarded by um, kind of every player in the system that um, are tasked with helping ensure that the crime victims in these cases have um, those rights enforced, um, or at least notified add, about. Add really quick, as if, if that law sounds familiar, it's been in the news a lot recently about Jeffrey Epstein. Yes. And being... Um, Another huge violation. <laughs> the being a central back. issue of, like, why weren't his victims informed of the steal that was made and these proceedings that were happening. Exactly. So. And my biggest concern was that this was all going to be happening post the court deciding that he didn't need to really be on probation anymore, or at least on the type of probation that we had understood he was on. Um, so I wanted to take action. I wanted really, um, really for the court also to hear from Lauren because... Mm -hmm. From my reviewing the transcripts of the original sentencing, the judge really seemed to um, take to heart what Lauren had said. Um, and I really felt like um, for Lauren, in our discussions and from what I, what I know of Lauren after knowing her for so long now, is that having her voice heard and speaking up for herself, but also for other folks who might have experienced similar um, crimes uh, or any crimes, is that really understanding what it feels like to um, suffer a victimization and then have the systems that are in place kind of pretend to really care but ultimately not care um, I think is is detrimental and so Lauren's kind of strength and really wanting to and really be empowered in, in helping the system really understand how it affected her I think was phenomenal um, so my biggest thing was like Lauren wants to talk to the court I want to get her into court mm -hmm. and make this happen so that's what we did so I want to come back to the importance of being heard. Um, first, I want to make sure everybody has the full picture of 
um, the flyer since it was you know it was an important part of your story being told. So just say a little bit about kind of how that decision played in. So maybe in the time that you were talking <laughs> to your boss, Bridget, um, I was sitting there like, what am I going to do? Um, and after work, I was at work when I spoke to you on the phone, and uh, after work with my little sister, Sarah, um, we <laughs> went to our favorite kind of after work spot where we have a lot of friends, um, and we have a lot of friends in the restaurant business. Um, and we were sitting on the patio outside, and I was livid, livid, so mad. And a friend of ours um, who works there uh, like dropped off some menus and was like, you know, what can I, what can I do for you guys? <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> here's what you can do. <laughs> do you know about this guy? Like, well, yes. Well, so I, I, I basically, I asked him, like, do you, do you know this person? Like, he works in the restaurant industry. Like, maybe you know of him. Um, and I think, like, maybe he had. And I found out a few people there did. Um, I also, that day, found out a bunch of my, not a bunch, a few of my friends knew him. Um, and I found out that this person was, really in my social circle um, and wasn't just a random man on the street that attacked me. Like he was in my life um, in ways that like I hadn't even realized. Um, and that's unsettling. Um, and Kristen talked about, you know, being worried for my physical safety with this person being so close and not being um, under supervision. Um, I was very worried about my emotional health and um, my, you know, well-being. Um, it was already such a difficult thing um, that I, I don't think I at that point had even begun to heal from. Um, and um, it mean it it made me so mad to think that every day I would have to walk to work and walk home from work, or you know go meet people, uh, friends on my own block, uh, in my own neighborhood and worry about seeing this person um, and worry about my friends and worry about the people in my community. Um, and knowing that he has such a blatant disregard for what the court has um, asked him to do and what he's agreed to do. Um, and I didn't want him to be anywhere near me. Um, I didn't want him to be in my community. and. I felt like the justice system didn't really care what was going on. Um, and to me, okay, getting, appealing this situation and like having, you know, this hearing where we get him back on supervised probation, like he's still down the street from me, like he's still in my community, I'm still gonna have to worry about all of these things. And I just didn't want him there. Um, and I wanted to feel safe. I wanted to be able to heal. Um, I wanted some normalcy in my life. Uh, and this you know, thing kept coming back up and I wasn't really getting an opportunity for that. Um, so to me, I sat there at Bar Pilar and uh, you know, I was like, hey, like, if I give you guys a photo of this person um, so that you know, your bartenders know that he is around, if he comes into your bar, like you know who he is and you, you, you know, like maybe try to like keep people safe from this person and that basically developed into the idea of making these flyers and um I called Kristen maybe the next day or you called me and I kind of like asked you like how legal is this <laughs> will I get in trouble like is this criminal um and uh she kind of like laid out for me the situation and um I felt like I came to a place where you know, it was definitely a risk for me to do this, but it was a risk that was worth it. Um, and made the flyers um, and started distributing them uh, in restaurants. And then eventually it ended up on social media and spread pretty quickly and was published in like the local paper. Um, and he ended up losing his job um, and we continued on with like our um, like legal plan um, and at the end of that, we decided that we wanted to take this story to the media. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, whenever I have a client who is, that is kind of part of their 
healing justice plan of taking things to the media. Um, we talk about kind of the different various avenues that we could explore. Um, I think in Lawrence's case, um, well, I don't think I know because I did it. <laughs> um, uh, and I talked with Bridget. Um, we'd had a couple of cases in the media over the years. We'd worked with a few really um, great reporters. Bridget herself is a former journalist, so always has really um, great partners. Um, clearly, I go to Bridget a lot <laughs> for advice. Um, and I think um, initially, uh, I think I had kind of put out feelers with a couple of different um, media outlets, some local news outlets, but um, ultimately kind of what I felt uh, in my discussions with Lauren is I, I wanted someone to not just do like a five minute segment on the local news. Not that like those things absolutely have value, but I think from our discussions, we really wanted to be able to have this story told um, in a way that Lauren um, was more involved um, and, and really, was able to capture the kind of the complexities, entire breadth of kind of how crime impacts a person and all of the various avenues in which that person might seek resources or relief in the ways that they get let down and the ways that they're able to be empowered. So um, ultimately, um, we felt that Amy was the person that we wanted to really explore this story with. Um, Amy had worked on the story with our organization before um, involving um, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, a really really great series if anybody hasn't read it yet um, and so um, I reached out to Amy and um, or maybe maybe Bridget did reached out I think it was Bridget reached out and we said we really want to we want to talk with you about something and um, so that's how it got started yeah. so before we move to that um, that moment when you guys started to talk and you two started to meet what had your experience been with journalists before you met Amy um, well, I'm a hairstylist. I have <laughs> journalists who come and sit in my chair. Uh, we don't really talk business. Uh, <laughs> me, sometimes they like tell me cool stories, but, um, and I dated a journalist. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, again, like not really talking business. Uh, no, no experience with journalists really in terms of like interacting with them as a source, like at all. Um, did you have any expectations about what that might be like? I was really scared. Uh, I have a friend actually um, who her husband uh, works for NPR and I, she was like, do you, like, you can talk to him, like maybe he'll make you feel better about it. And like I sat down <laughs> with him for like a while and I was like, what am I going to say? Like, like I was just, I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but like I think tr like trusting somebody with this information, like they can do so many different things with it. It's mm -hmm. out of my control kind of, you know, once I give it to them. So um, I think that, yeah, I was, I was very worried about mm -hmm. how it would be portrayed um, or, you know, what are you going to tell, like, the whole story? Like, are you just going to use, like, bits at work? I really didn't think that it would end up being um, such an in-depth story. Like, mm -hmm. that is not at all kind of what I saw coming. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I had a lot of worries and zero experience. Um, I was pretty nervous. So um, one of the things that you have said kind of compelled you in the face of that anxiety about it to move forward and meet Amy was something that feels kind of like a chain of trust. You trusted Kristen and the organization. Kristen had not, I think, actually worked with Amy directly at that point, but Kristen trusted Bridget, who had worked with Amy and who had heard great things, and that at least sort of set the table. And I think that's one of the things that's sort of interesting about what we learned about trust in this is that the links in the chain, you can't always see and you can't plan, and yet they're what lead you to a situation in which more trust can grow. Yeah, and that was such a you told me, oh, this is someone Bridget trusts and recommends, and I, I, I'm pretty sure my response was like, well, I trust you, and you trust her, like, <laughs> so let's do it. And even though I was nervous, it was as simple as that. It really was. So talk about your first meeting. Um, yeah, so <laughs> from my end, I mean, I, I was nervous to meet Lauren as well. You know, it, it's, it's difficult to have that initial conversation, especially when you're in a sterile conference room, you know, with attorneys and sitting at the table. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like we're just hanging out on the sofa in a relaxed environment. It, it kind of is 
it's a little bit of a tense environment to begin with. And um, I know that uh, that going into this, probably that you didn't have any experience in dealing with the press. So I didn't want Lauren to be like, well, forget this, you know, upon meeting me, I don't want to do this. Um, I also wanted to give her a reasonable expectation of what this process would be. I think that sometimes people have the misconception that you just tell your story to a reporter and poof, it's in the it's in the paper and it happens and it's quick and um, and for, unfortunately it, it's not like that. It's it's extremely demanding process to go through this uh, as as you did as the subject of a piece and. I, I think I was up front from you from the beginning about what that process would require, the type of transparency that would be needed. Um, and in return, I offered full transparency on our end. You know, for instance, uh, visibility into the reporting process. Uh, the, the initial meeting, I off the bat said, I taped it, but I said to Lauren, like, I'm not going to use any of this without your permission. This is, I'm just taping it so I can have some notes so I can go back and don't, and I don't forget everything that was said here, you know. And that's crucial for me. That was like, I can, I can relax and like tell you my story um, without being like very worried about what I'm saying because I will have, you know, I'll be able to be like. Yeah, yeah, I think sometimes people are worried that we're just going to cherry pick a quote and yeah. take it out of context and not fact check it. And um, with a story this sensitive, uh, there had to be a level of trust that had to be built where she knew that her story was safe with me and that we were going to get it over the finish line. And then from my perspective, you know, I had to be clear that like I, I'm not here to be your friends, you know. I'm I'm here. I'm going to be asking really tough, demanding questions of you and of the people around you. And this process is not going to be fun at all times. And and there was one um, initial sticking point in our conversation. Do you remember? No. <laughs> I'm sure I will. Um, well, you said initially that you were not comfortable saying that you had made the flyers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't at the first meeting though. Oh, it wasn't. It was on the phone. Yeah, because I remember, I remember the moment that you asked me the first time at that meeting, like, "Do you know who made the flyers?" And I was like, "I did it." <laughs> <laughs> but I paused for a long time, and I kind of like looked at Chris, and I was like, "Do I say?" I was like, "What is she gonna do?" Yeah. And like, I mean, part yeah, of the reason because, because at the time the flyers had been in the city paper, but they didn't write about who made the flyers. It was a mystery. These flyers just started being hand. I was very out. protective about like my identity in terms yeah. of doing that um, for many reasons. Um, but I remember that moment, and I remember just kind of thinking like, what do I say? And I thought you might like jump in and be like, don't do it. <laughs> and I was like, she's not doing anything. So I think we had discussed beforehand too. I think we had discussed like it. It might come up and yeah. And we're, you know, you're kind of like, maybe I'm, I'm not sure. We'll figure it out, and we figured it out. <laughs> figured it out. <laughs> but I think like the fact that she, it you would know, have also been like really obvious if I was like, no, no yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, um, <laughs> well, I think the fact that you that you uh, you were, you know, recording it, and that it was basically like. I am gonna have like last say over like whatever is used. I felt like you know what I can be honest with her and just tell her the whole story. And like if I don't feel comfortable like moving forward with something that I've said, then like I won't. Um, and then the next time that we really like talked about it again was on the phone, and I was like, yeah, I don't want to tell anybody that I did that. So yeah, and then I I went to my editor because I had told him about the story, and I said. You know, she said that I, I don't know if she's willing to say that she made the flyers. And we had a conversation, and my editor and I were both in agreement that if she wasn't willing to say that she made the flyers, then we didn't feel like we could do the story because um, you're missing the full story and you're sel selectively omitting um, something that, you know, we know to be true, which kind of changes the. I mean, this is a story about truth, ultimately, yeah. and and um, so I, then we had a follow-up conversation. We worked it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, I I left it up to Lauren because I mean, if if at that point if she wanted to, you probably could have taken the story to to someone else. Or yeah, I yeah. definitely, you definitely did. You were patient with me. You explained everything to me and yeah. why it was important that I 
um, come forward with that information. Um, and also on a personal level. Um, it wasn't just like, oh, my editor says this and I agree and like this is why you need to like say this. You also like, I think, um, you gave me a little insight into what this story was, how it looked for you and like, uh, you know, you're like, this is like, people aren't going to see you as like, uh, it, like this in a bad light, like this is heroic, like this is... Um... For me it was a moment, it was a key moment because it was her kind of flipping the script and taking back her power in this process where she's just been like run down to the ground for years of dealing with this legal situation and to have a story where you can't have that realization and have that moment, um, it would be a massive hole in a story. So it wasn't a, a situation of me going and like blaming on, it on my editor. Like my editor says we have to have this. You know, sometimes sometimes people like to do that as a trick to like strong arm people. Just blame it, blame everything on the editor. But we, I, I felt super strongly about it that it just as compelling as the story as it was, it, it wouldn't be possible without that. It's really interesting because the reason you felt strongly about it is because of how you saw Lauren's story and how you saw that moment as part of Lauren's resilience and heroism and, you know, a shift for her, which it sounds like helped Lauren see it that way. And one of the other things that's really interesting as you talk about where the trust was coming from is Lauren was in control of her story. I mean, it was scary to share. There was uncertainty about what's going to happen with it. And yet you offered the reassurance at, you know, uh, a couple of different points that it was still her story. Um, and I think that's, you know, that clearly was a key part of how the trust continued to build. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the challenges in a moment, but I want to bring Maura in, um, who has been uh, sort of reliving this in part, I think. Um, so at the time that some of this was happening, you were and have been and were covering food and restaurants for the Washington Post. And um, as the as this was happening, the Me Too movement was starting. So talk a little bit about kind of what you were hearing about at that point in terms of what was happening in restaurants. Sure. Um, so around the time I entered the story, and I think around the time that Amy was talking to all of you was when the Harvey Weinstein story broke. Mm -hmm. And after that, there were a number of other stories, obviously, um, going after high profile people in every kind of field. And in the food world, the first one that broke was John Besh um, in New Orleans. And you know that kind of started a lot of people looking into the behavior of, of chefs in restaurants. Um, and it was something that we had considered in the food section of the Post um, writing about beforehand. Um, and you know, all these other celebrity chefs were, were kind of subject to these gotcha stories. Um, and, and some of them I wrote, I mean, uh, later throughout that year, uh, I wrote about Mario Batali and all of the things that he did. Um, I wrote a lot of stories about Mike Isabella here in DC. But the first story I did um, was one that w was really important to me because I felt at the time that we were really focused as a culture on the bad behavior of celebrities and prominent men. Um, and in the restaurant industry, this is not something that's just a celebrity thing. You know, there have been studies in the restaurant industry um, about how many women have to deal with sexual harassment. And it's up to 80% of women who work in this industry who have reported being sexually harassed or assaulted either by a customer or by their boss or by one of their colleagues. And so it was really important to me that we do a story saying like, this is not just about people who work in fancy celebrity kitchens. This is about people who work in McDonald's. This is about people who work in neighborhood restaurants in Washington, DC. Um, and so with another reporting partner from the features section, um, we started interviewing, I think at one point, it, it ended up being 60 women who told us their stories of sexual harassment and assault in the restaurant industry. Um, and another woman came to me, uh, actually I think I had heard about her story through a local photographer who connected us. Um, and, and she came to me and she told me her story of, of working for a chef at Vidalia here in DC, um, who, and it was, it was a rather complicated story, 
because she was assaulted by him, but she was also briefly in a relationship with him. Um, and I think at this point also, the Me Too movement hadn't quite like grasped that nuance. Um, it was more about bad men doing bad things and not about the subtleties and like all the various insidious ways that this can happen in a workplace. Um, but anyway, I started, I started interviewing this, this woman and, um, and her story was terrible. Uh, and you know, I had heard through the grapevine, I guess, like that so, someone was like, you know, I think, I think one of the people that you're writing about um, is also part of a story in investigative right now. And Amy and I didn't know each other at all. Um, and actually, I think this is the first time anyone from the food section has ever collaborated with someone in the investigative <laughs> section. <laughs> so that's a Washington Post first. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I know how you heard of it, because when I realized that, that your attacker was a chef, and I realized that I, I was hearing through, through you that he had assaulted people in the restaurant industry, I thought, well, I need to walk upstairs to <laughs> the eighth floor and tell someone who writes about the restaurant industry because one thing about being an investigative is that you're always in someone's lane, you know, since we, since we don't have beats, you know, I'm like suddenly veering over into the restaurant industry and I didn't want to be that person who's, who's bigfooting someone and taking a story that's potentially on their beat. So I went up there and I talked to um, Emily who was working with you and I'm like, just a heads up, I'm doing the story. It's about a guy who's a chef, and she said, well, that sounds familiar. I think, <laughs> I think my colleague Mara might be doing that story. So then we realized that we were working on a story about the same man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so then, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting, too, because then um, I was kind of faced, Emily, the other reporter I was working on the story with, and I were faced with this choice because we had this great story in our laps from, from the other woman who had been assaulted by the same person. Um, and you know, and I had like a very looming deadline, like within two weeks, and we had wanted to include her in this original story. But then, after talking to Amy and talking to Amy's editor, you know, we realized it was part of something much bigger. Um, and so we actually withheld her from the original story. We published that story without her. I mean, I had talked to a lot of people, so there were like a lot of other examples, unfortunately. Um, but. She, she was left out of that story um, so that we could contribute to the bigger picture of what had happened in Lauren's case because we'd also learned that there were other women in the restaurant industry who had been assaulted by the same person. Um, and so, yeah, so, so um, doing that initial story too, I think um, as a reporter, it was the first time that I had really worked with victims of crime, because this is not something that comes up when you're a food writer very often. Um, <laughs> you know, I like to joke that I write about sandwiches most of the time. <laughs> so like, this, is not, this is not something that was part of my training initially. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, it was kind of overwhelming how many people were coming to me with stories of terrible things that had happened to them. And, and it was a beat that I continued for, I guess, more than a year, really. Um, I, I wrote multiple stories about sexual harassment in the restaurant industry, and I was at one point so overwhelmed because I was really, um, you know, I, I felt really strongly that I did not want to be another source of trauma to the people who were coming to me and trusting me to tell their stories. And so it was very important to me um, that I could be trusted by them and also that, that I could do their story justice and tell tell their stories in a way that also didn't cause further harm to them. Um, and one thing that was kind of interesting, you know, um, it was weird too because I was having like nightmares about chefs in restaurants at the time. And I, I talked to a friend, a college friend, who is a psychologist who works with um, victims of sexual assault. She lives in Utah. Um, and she, she had, you know, we were talking on the phone and she's like, yeah, I've been reading your stories and, you know, I was thinking about like what I would tell my clients if they had come to you um, and like how, how I would have them talk to a reporter and I was like, tell me what I should do to talk to them so that I can make them like feel safe and secure. Um, and so, and she gave me a lot of like really good reporting tips that, um, I mean, Lauren and I actually didn't speak directly during the process of this at all because Amy was her person, and I was kind of working with some of the other people. Um, but I had I just learned a lot about trauma and how to talk to victims, um, and and have them tell their story in a way that didn't 
cause further harm to them. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So let's talk, all of you talk more about some of the challenges as you were trying to balance kind of who owns the story, how can I minimize harm, how can we shed light on these public injustices um, while we're still sort of getting to know how much we can trust each other. So talk some more about what some of those challenges were and how you overcame them. And meanwhile, um, I'm sure there are people in the room who have questions, so we will come uh, in just a moment to that as well. I think for me, the, one of the biggest challenges was how do we tell the story in a way that does justice to it? Because Lauren is one of the most remarkable people that I've met. Um, it's very unusual to meet someone like her because her whole story, it's nuanced, it's complicated in many ways. In many ways, it's a very simple story of a woman who was jogging on a beautiful night in DC um, and this happened to her. Uh, it, and when you're trying to tell a story of how a system failed, you know, one person, of how this case kind of fell through the cracks, of um, the lapses in the probation, of him not getting the services he was supposed to get, of the breaking of the, of the protective orders, sometimes you feel like you can get bogged down in, in legalese, no offense to the lawyers in the room. <laughs> um, so it, it's a real challenge, and one thing that we did, and this was not intentional, but the story took a long time to report and write because of some delays on my end of getting pulled into another story. But there was a moment kind of at the end of 2018 where we were trying to decide if we were going to rush this into the paper before Christmas, not that it's like some light holiday reading or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we really took a moment to let the story breathe. and. Mm -hmm. When I say that, I brought some props. So <laughs> these are um, these are all the uh, some of the mini drafts of the story that we went through. And it's interesting because if you look at the earlier drafts, um, the the main thing that we did was cut. We cut mm. from from the top, and we really really stripped it down. There are a lot of different ways to get into a story like this. You know, we toyed around with the idea of well, do we start with the flyers? You know. Do we start with the mystery of the flyers? Do we start with Lauren jogging? Where do we start? How do we encompass everything that happened? And in the end, we, we really stripped it down. And I think that if you look back and read the story, there's only one quote from Lauren that was said in a conversation to me, like in an interview. The rest of it is um, her actions. It's her words in the middle of the process. It's the words that she said in court. That are, that are more powerful than anything that could ever be said in an interview to me later. So it was just, the big challenge for me was like, if I do my job effectively, if Mara does her job effectively, we can make the story soar. So figuring out how to do that mm -hmm. was the biggest challenge, yeah. It sounds like you, you had just such a tremendous sense of responsibility, mm -hmm. given the trust that had been placed in you. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit, Lauren, about, and others chime in, about those couple of days right before the story was published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember, do you remember? Um, you go, because yeah. start. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember going over to your apartment building because um, I had to pick up, uh, I think it was a copy of, of the flyer because we wanted to get a, a good clean scan copy of it to include with the story. And I remember that, that Lauren told me that she was really concerned that she was going to come across as a victim, that she was going to be Lauren the victim. And I was more concerned, I think, about how it would portray um, survivors of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just that I was going to be made out to be a victim. I was more concerned about the message being this is trauma and this is something that cannot be overcome. And I felt like, I mean, this process was like huge for me, mm -hmm. uh, transformative. And uh, somewhere along the way, I feel like I changed and um, I just, 
didn't want, I didn't want the kind of like message that I kind of, I guess, came in with myself. Like, this is, this is crazy. Like, this is what's happened to me. And like, it's terrible. And everybody needs to know about these injustices. Um, I think that I wanted there to be some sort of like message of like, this is, it's not um, insurmountable. It like, doesn't mm-hmm. define you. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it's not more than you are mm-hmm. as a survivor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I was worried about. So when she told me that, like 12 hours before the story <laughs> was supposed to publish, I panicked. I went home. I reread the story. Sorry. <laughs> I was, have I, I'm like, have I messed this up? Have I totally messed this up? I was looking for any sort of red flags, any problematic language, hoping I didn't fall into a trap along the way. And I called you or texted you, and I said, I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the story went live the next morning. Yeah. 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 And for me, it was just something that I needed to kind of like say, like, mm-hmm. and I'm sorry I did it at the final hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you always were asking me how I was feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, at that point, we had known each other for a year and been, had been working on this story for a year, and that's how I was feeling. And so, I, you know, I told you. And I had really had no idea what to expect. And so if I had known, you know, what this story was, there, I, there was nothing for me to worry about. So one how did you I, feel? I, I was oh, going to say, one thing I feel like I didn't fully prepare you for is how many people would read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we we, nobody was prepared. I yeah, remember you talking exactly. about just how many clicks. You're like, how many clicks? I'm like, oh, my God, or views or whatever. I was yeah. Like, I was, uh, you, never, you never know, oh especially gosh. in the Trump news cycle. You never know what any day is going to bring, what's going to blow up the website. Um, I thought a couple of things were potentially working against us when it comes to getting people to read it. Number one, the Washington Post now is more of a national global brand than, unfortunately, uh, a place where the local content gets the hits that it used to get or the eyeballs that it used to get in the 80s and 90s. So I thought, well, this is a local story. Uh, it doesn't involve someone famous. Um, I don't know. I didn't... I. I always like to manage expectations <laughs> because I, I never know. But that morning when I woke up, it was it was surging um, on Twitter. It was number one on the website. It had an insane uh, engagement time, as for which is how long people spend reading the story. Um, it, that number was through the roof, which meant that people were were getting through the story, which is a long story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that is also a testament to the fact that this story is so relatable, the way that you told it, like this issue, it's not just my story, this is a problem. Mm-hmm. And it's present, and it's mm-hmm. not just my problem. Mm-hmm. And what, what was really surprising is that the, the majority of emails that I got were from men. I did not expect that. Men from Canada, men from Australia, all over the world. Um, and, and they were very insightful emails. Um, people who wanted to to express support for you, people who read it and found it to be a think piece. You know, th- we've described on the stage the moment of her putting up the flyers as a heroic moment, but there are people who also don't agree with that. It's a moment that people reach in the story, and uh, some people have very different opinions about your decision to do that, mm-hmm. which is why I, I like the complexity of it from a writer's mm-hmm. perspective, because it makes you think, well, how did how did you get to that point? Mm-hmm. And what would you do if you were in that situation? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's what I got some emails from dads who thought about their daughters when they read it, or their granddaughters, and what they would want for them to do, and how they would want them to respond in a situation like that. And if I remember right, um, you also got some offers of people who wanted to go jogging with you so that you'd go yeah. running again. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I did. Um, have you taken any of them up on the offers? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it the other day, though. Really? Yeah, I was like, you know, maybe I'll go for a run. Uh, maybe I will. Okay. On that note, um, are there questions in the... We have Andy Kohler, who's going to walk around with the microphone. Uh, 
Hi, my name's Karen Allman. I, I'm curious to Maura and how this has influenced your reporting and writing. Because as you said, intuitively you wouldn't think that this comes across your plate, yeah. pardon the pun, too often. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, uh, it did end up becoming like a, a part of my beat. I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, because I mean, I hate that these things have happened to people. Um, but but they are some of the most gratifying stories that I've written, and I, I really was writing a lot about Me Too over the last year. Um, I we did gosh, I did two Mario Batali stories. I think like four or five Mike Isabella stories. There was a lot there, um, and then a story about the Mindful Restaurant Group in DC, which um, was a, a different kind of Me Too story because um, it it was. Um, that that was a really interesting story to write because there were there was like a large number of people who came forward, but it was more about their frustration with the system, sort of like Lauren, but but within just the microcosm of that restaurant, um, and so it was really about how they felt like they were never going to get any kind of answer or justice. It, it was a story that left you with a very different feeling than this one, um, but uh, yeah, it it has. Um, it has really influenced my reporting in a lot of ways, um, especially in the way that I talk to people um, who have been traumatized. Um, one of one of the great pieces of, for the reporters in the room. Um, one of the great pieces of advice that my friend, who was a psychologist, gave me um, was that, and this is so simple. It was, it's kind of crazy that I had never thought of it. And whenever I tell reporters this too, they're like, "Oh my God, this is such a good idea." And like. It's very simple, but no one ever really arrives at it. But um, I now, whenever I talk to someone about something really, really heavy, um, at the end of the call, I tell them to like call their sister or their mom or their best friend, so that they're talking to someone who's not a reporter. Because you know, when and I don't know if you felt this way at the end of some of your conversations, but you know, after you've talked to a reporter, you kind of get in your head about um, what did I say? Did I say the right things? Like how is my experience going to be reflected? And just having like a friendly voice who's not a stranger who works for a newspaper um, to talk you down from that is like incredibly helpful. And people that I've worked with on these stories who have told me that they have done that were like, that was really good advice. And so now I tell every reporter I know, like, <laughs> tell them to call a friend, do the phone a friend thing, because <laughs> cause it really leaves people in a much better place. Um, and so that's like the one piece of advice that I have for for other journalists, and I think, like, just really taking care of people's um, well-being uh, as as you're going through them through this process with them, especially because it can be a very long process. You know, we worked on this story for, I think it was like a year and three months. Really, it was a long time. Um, and the mindful restaurant story I did was was like a seven-month process. Um, so, so you're with these people for a while, and and um, you know, you you care about their well-being, and you want to check in on them. Um, at the same time, you need to get all the information that you need. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I think like and my phone a friend was Kristen basically <laughs> all the time, um, and she is incredible. And like doing this without her would have been, I think, impossible. As magnificent know. as I don't know as Amy has been. If anybody could have done that. Man, without I don't know. Me. You really it was <laughs> it was key. Well, the good thing was none of you had to do it alone. Yeah. Yeah, I will exactly. say just one more piece of advice for the journalists in the room. If you are hearing stories of trauma, um, even just one, but especially like what you're doing where 60 folks are talking to you, um, you are undoubtedly probably going to experience vicarious trauma. Um, and it's real. When you were talking about your nightmares, I was like, mm -hmm. vicarious trauma, there it is. <laughs> um, and it is absolutely, I would encourage you to, it's like to seek out whatever kind of um, mental health treatment works for you, whether it's like talk therapy or talking to a friend who tells you it's okay that they're, you're talking to them about it. Um, but I would say like, you know, it's real hearing people tell you those stories over and over again um, ha absolutely has an impact. So it definitely had an impact on, on you and I think mm -hmm. um, it's important to take care of yourself so that you can take care of those folks' stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. What other questions do we have? Hi. My name is Viola. Thanks very much. Good discussion. Um, I had two questions. Um, one is, Lauren, how did you feel about that long period of time? And was there any <laughs> point during that when you thought, oh, they may not run the story? And how, how, how did that go? And how, um, 
and Amy, how did you reassure her and how, mm-hmm. how certain were you that it was actually going to pan out in the end? And, and I guess that the other question is, you mentioned a couple of times that you told Lauren that she was in control of the story, but journalistically, the, the subject is not necessarily mm-hmm. in control. What did you mean by that and how did you handle that? Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Uh, it was really hard. <laughs> um, I had been engaging with the story itself for five years, um, almost constantly. And then as soon as we had the final hearing, it was like, okay, Washington Post. Like, and we started working on that. Um, and uh, initially, you know, like we had kind of talked about like, oh, like this is what the timeline looks like. And like, it didn't at all happen that way, which was it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, my expectations were, you know, you were definitely honest about like, oh, the timeline is, can't be, you know, it's not solid. But I don't think that I anticipated it being such, um, you know, an extensive time period. I am ultimately glad that it was because I think that um, it, I actually had some time to um, like reflect and process um, where I wasn't engaging with like the legal battle or with this person um, in my community any longer. Um, and it was the first time that I got to breathe, really. Um, and I think there were definitely moments where I was like, Amy, like what's going on? <laughs> um, and then kind of it began to like matter to me a little bit less that I was like, oh, you know, like I was just more, I was more understanding. I felt like you know, it'll happen when it happens. But there was definitely a time where I was like, I want to be done with this. I want to be done with it. And I actually, I think at one point I called Amy, I was like, are we doing this? Like, <laughs> do I need to like take this somewhere else? Because like, I really just want to set this down. Um, luckily, in the time period that we were working on it, I kind of working um, on my own, you know, healing process, um, which, you know, the story was a part of. Um, but obviously, there's more to it than that. Uh, came to a place where I just felt comfortable with like letting it unfold um, in the time that it was going to unfold. From from my standpoint, um, the delay was really difficult and it was not ideal at all. And it was a situation that was a little bit out of our control because I was pulled into another story that ended up lingering for way past what it should have lingered. Um, she always explained to me like the delays and other, yeah. yeah. And this was the Charlie Rose story. Yeah. This wasn't like a little thing. It that was, she was Charlie Rose for. and CBS, and um, the reporting on that kept going much longer. And I felt really bad because, you know, I remember the first time that I met Lauren, it was two days before we got the Charlie Rose tip, mm-hmm. you know? So then you don't want to tell someone, well, sorry, I have to go take this other tip of this famous person because that, you know, conveys that your story you know, is, isn't to the level of Charlie Rose, but that doesn't mean in any way that I, I felt as if that story was more important. It was just a matter of we were under deadline pressure and had to do it. So the delays were difficult because not only did we need Lauren to be on board as there were other women who were assaulted or mistreated by, by Hiro in the workplace, who we also needed to be on board for the story to tell the collective impact of uh, the failures of the justice system and the other women that were affected by that and by your decision to put up the flyers and the other women who came forward. So explaining the delays to them was also difficult. Um, At one point we got on a call with one of the women and I said, who had been talking to Mara, and I said, look, this is not Mara's fault, this is all my (laughs) fault. (laughs) Trust me, (laughs) Um, because that was the truth. It was not at all a delay on Mara's end and I didn't want their relationship to be strained um, because of of my delays. Um, As far as what I said about uh, Lauren being in control, if at any moment Lauren had said, I'm out, I'm done, the story would have died. Um, I mean, I truly respected um, the fact that it is her story, it happened to her, and her participation was key in it. When it comes to, to my philosophy of being transparent, is I don't want anyone who is in my story to read the Washington Post and be surprised by what they see in that article. Um, pertaining to them, and that means not only Lauren, but Hiro. You know, I don't want him to read the article and say, well, I wasn't asked about this, I wasn't asked to comment, I wasn't explained the context in which this would be presented. So we operate on our team with a philosophy of radical transparency. 
that uh, she the trust she you were always transparent with me and you did make me feel like the story itself how it's written and like what happens is not necessarily in my in my control but you gave me so much agency in um, you know what I was comfortable with and you always checked in with me in terms of those things and you always explained deadlines and just kind of what was going on every step of the way every question I had you answered and um, it, it made a world of difference I think we we have time for maybe one more question if there's one more Sarah I think we have to have Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll wait for the mic <laughs> So the title of this event is Invisible Ways Reporters Can Show That They Can Be Trusted or Can't. And I'm also just kind of curious about the or can't. <laughs> and like in what ways, like maybe working in this field, you've been inspired to show, to work harder to be trusted because you've seen other reporters kind of be sleazier. I don't know if like the whole strong arming someone by blaming your editor, is that like a trustworthy thing? I don't know. Yeah. Just or are you asking me to throw people under the bus? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's funny because I always um, sometimes I joke with my parents. I'm like, if any reporters come knocking on the door, do not answer the door. <laughs> do not talk to them before you talk to me and explain what's going on. Um, as far as the can't, um, I'm trying to think if I personally have seen any behavior that's been alarming. In, in doing these panels about Me Too stories and, and kind of being in this universe of reporters who's done these types of stories, you do sometimes hear about people who have lost trust in the reporters. Mm -hmm. And for, from what I've heard, it goes back to people feeling like their words have been misconstrued or context has not been presented within pieces. Um, I always want to know if someone's going to be upset with me. I would rather hear their complaints prior to publication than when the story publishes. Um, so that's why I really believe in transparency. Even people who are the subject or the so-called target of an investigation deserve that level of transparency. So every single detail they have a chance to respond to. Mara, do you have any examples of can'ts? Um, well, I mean, I think that we had a moment of can't in this story, which is that it took so long, um, <laughs> and that some some people were really having trouble trusting that it was going to happen. And I mean, unfortunately, that was like a little bit outside of our control because it was it was really about um, deadline pressure for Amy's story and the priorities of the investigative section. Um, but like that was a moment where I was like, I don't know if we're doing right by everyone here, and like. It, it was like prolonging their trauma, really, to like have to wait for this story to come out and like have this still be a part of their life for so long when they wanted to move on. And so, like, I don't think we, you know, I don't think we did everything perfectly because, um, like, I think that that was a moment where it was hard for everyone to trust us. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things that that speaks to very clearly is the issue of time, mm -hmm. and um, I think one of the things that you hear from people who trust the media less, who have actually interacted with journalists, is a sense of like being bulldozed, feeling like, you know, there's no time to really talk or listen, or have, or in a reporter's case, take the care they want to be able to take with a particular story. So I do think time is part of it. Um, you know, in this case, there was a lot of time invested in telling the story and in telling the story authentically and um, fairly and carefully. And unfortunately, just because of the nature of the business and the demands, um, in addition to other things, I think that's one of the things that has undermined trust for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't want to end on that note. <laughs> <laughs> one more question? So, <laughs> Do you want to, oh, Andy. Oh, we'll take two. We'll do Andy Bridges. Okay. Oh, I was going to ask you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, thank oh. you all so much. Um, and thank you, Lauren, for just how courageous it is to show up and continue to talk about this so others can learn how we do better. Um, really value that. And I also have a question. We struggle with often as advocates trusting um, who's going to have fidelity in our clients and survivor stories. I just happen to trust you because I saw the work that you did. Um, 
But we see lots of examples where that's not happening. And what we've asked is questions to other reporters about where do you get skills about how to empower someone that's experienced trauma? How do you create choice when you don't actually control the story? All the things that have come up tonight. And the answer we often get is that those tools don't exist. There isn't like a, a like ABA for journalists that's a subcommittee on trauma-informed journal journalism. What would it take to create a resource where survivors' stories are informing the work of how journalists are more responsible and truthful about how survivor stories are told? I'd love to hear ideas from either of you or either of you on what those tools might look like. Can, can I just say two things real quick before turning it to you guys? Um, I think programs like Tonight help. People are here, people will learn from it, people will watch the video. Um, there is the DART Center, which is very specifically focused on training journalists to cover trauma. I think um, our understanding of the nature of trauma and the nature of sexual violence outside of this room, outside of certain uh, parts of the world, is so primitive. And so I think you know all the things that um, many people are doing and, and that has happened in part through the Me Too movement are helping to broaden everybody's understanding, not just people who are covering it, but you know, siblings, parents, neighbors, friends, colleagues, understanding of what it means to experience sexual harassment or sexual violence and how to be an ally and how to respond. I mean, there was, there was an interesting moment that I had in the editing of the story. Uh, there's a, a part of the story later where one of the women who uh, said that she was assaulted by Hiro in the, no, I'm sorry, this is a different woman. She had met him through a dating app, and she said that uh, he sexually assaulted her when she was drunk and unable to give consent and did not remember the encounter. And uh, my editor wanted to add in the line that said that she didn't call the police. And I said, sure, mm -hmm. that's fine. We can add in that line. And he said, well, we need a reason why. Why didn't she call the police? And I said, <laughs> and I respect my editor a lot, um, and I just took it as a moment to have a little bit of an education, and I said, let me explain to you the reason why the vast majority of these sexual assaults go unreported. And I said, are you aware and of the, the statistics of this universe? Um, and I said, on the flip side, look what happened to Lauren. She did, you know, she did flag down the police immediately, <laughs> and we're writing about her case was mishandled. So I think that there needs to be a lot more direct, direct conversations in newsrooms about let's understand why why these things exist the way that they do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's also, it's not just the writers, and um, you know, I think that Amy did such an incredible job. Um, I think that I was very afraid that you wouldn't be sensitive in some moments, but you, I feel like you really always were. Um, but then you're also taking that, my story, to mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. And um, they may not know what's going on. And you may be sensitive and you may be aware of all of these like, very important things. Um, but that's a whole different battle as well. It, it, it's a good point, though. It, I mean, something can, you, you can follow you know, 99 steps and make the choices that feel right. And then a story gets turned over to a copy editor who switches something to victim or switches, you know, or in, injects a word that isn't what you would have intended. Sometimes those things happen. I think, again, the more, um, the more people in positions of influence have these conversations, the more everybody in the room understands the implications of those decisions and things continue to improve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on that note. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say it, it's great that you actually asked that because I the question I wanted to ask is since you're kind of actually the beginning of the chain of trust in all of this, yes, um, I wanted to hear from you a little bit of the answer to your own question, which is what are the things that you saw in Amy's previous work that made you say, yes, this is a person who can be trusted, if you don't mind answering? Not at all. Um, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I don't think people could uplift you enough um, for what you've done, Amy, not just to tell Lauren's story, but another client's story um, in a way that, to me, did two of the core things that we do to combat re-victimization or re-traumatization. You empowered them and you gave them choice. 
Um, and I think that's really hard to do. Um, and part of that is expectation setting and the transparency is, is really that core value, right? Of I'm going to expectation set for you every step along the way. And at some point, what I'm telling you is gonna have to happen based on the information you're giving me. I can't do that. This will go away. Like you valued her choice over how powerful this story could have been for you in the Washington Post and um, for survivors. And I don't want to speak for Lauren specifically in her experience, but what we anecdotally know in the work you know that Kristen does every day is that it's giving back someone that moment of control and an experience that has taken so much of their control away that makes her feel like finally this is her heroic moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's just something so beautiful that like you went through years of the justice system that is traditionally set up to create this powerful moment of like, I told my victim impact statement, they've heard from me, you gave her that amplified voice. Um, and I saw you give that to someone else in a way that sometimes we don't see. And it is, it is that insertion that you mm -hmm. talked about of exonerate, the prosecutors exonerated by not charging. Mm -hmm. Saying that about someone who has sexually assaulted an individual but it can't be proved beyond a reasonable doubt is not, is not accurate, right? Mm -hmm. But that happens a lot because it's easier to digest for readers. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to be warriors in this space, and I'm so glad that you're having this event and in this conversation, to say like our role in advocating for survivors like Lauren is to be a part of don't put exoneration when that's not what not charging means. Um, and those little tiny details that are really more living the truth of, of what the stories are. So um, I think we need to keep having these conversations. And of course, I could talk about this all night and I'll stop. But um, so thank you for making the space to talk about it. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Andy, for making sure we asked that question. And I want to thank all of you. Um, I want you guys to uh, join me in thanking Lauren and Kristen and Amy and Mora. Uh, I want to uh, thank, thank all of the supporters and friends and colleagues of theirs who are in the room with us tonight. Thank you to Andy, not just for answering that question, but for p helping put this program together. And to the Press Club team that uh, makes all of us feel welcome here, makes our jobs, yes, makes our jobs so easy. <laughs> We appreciate them. Uh, and before we leave, uh, I want to talk about someone who is not here. Uh, you may have noticed uh, some of us wearing pins that say, free Austin Tice. Austin is the only American journalist who is being held abroad. He um, has been detained 2,537 days now in Syria. And uh, he was taken while reporting, actually, for the Washington Post and for McClatchy. The U.S. government believes that he is alive and is working very hard to bring him home. We stand with his family, and we hope that you will too. It will be seven years next month that he has been gone. You can see his photography in the lobby when you go through, and you can learn more about him and his case at austinticefamily.com. We are planning um, another campaign, as we periodically have, uh, this one will be Ask About Austin. If you're interested in participating, let me know. Um, and thank you in advance for supporting him. And thank you guys again for being here and for supporting them. Mm -hmm.